So to get started in geometry, uh, what we're doing in geometry is we're investigating, we're investigating a, a certain kind of quantity. That's what we talked about yesterday in, um, in the, the, our class on introduction to classical mathematics. There's a certain type of quantity that we're going to investigate or study in classical geometry. We're going to study magnitudes at rest. That's the subject magnitudes at rest. We talked about how there are four different kinds of quantity. In yesterday's class, um, there's multitude um, by itself or absolute multitude, which we study in arithmetic. There's multitude in relation to other multitudes. We talked about relative multitude and how we study that in what's called music and why it's called music. Uh, and then we said there's another kind of, mul of of quantity called magnitude, and there's two kinds, magnitude at rest, which we study here in geometry, and magnitude in motion, which we study in astronomy. So four kinds of quantity. Um, in geometry, like I said, we study magnitude at rest. In astronomy, we study magnitude when it's in motion. And we talked about why yesterday. So in this class on Friday mornings, what I'm planning to do is uh, go over these two mathematical arts that relate to magnitude. So it's geometry and astronomy. We have to get through geometry first because astronomy depends on geometry. So we can't study astronomy until we've learned uh, geometry, at least, at least a little bit of it. And then we can start to, to work in astronomy. So today, we're going to get started with the beginning of classical geometry. Now, classical it's, it, this is not like modern science. And, and when we get into classical philosophy and classical mathematics, you're going to see how sloppy modern science is. This is one of the reasons why, um, as a teacher, uh, I, I feel bad for kids who go to school and learn modern science because... Not, not because there's anything wrong with modern science, but there's so much wrong with how modern science is taught, how modern science is thought about, how modern science is talked about, and so on. And for kids to go into modern science classes with none of this background, with, with no careful teaching, no philosophical teaching, um, you're going to see, as we get into this, you're going to see how sloppy modern sciences especially if you're in a mo if if you're in any modern science classes right now you're going to see just how careless modern science classes are how careless modern science textbooks are how sloppy modern science thinking and talk is and how how careful and accurate ancient philosophy was that's the one thing i think you'll notice the most how careful ancient philosophers were uh, to make sure that when they investigated a subject they did so one step at a time, and they made sure that every single step they took was exactly certain, and they could move from that step to another step to another step, uh, which we do not do in modern science classes. Um, I actually did a, a couple of, of just, uh, I wouldn't say fun, because they're not really fun, but they're sort of experiments where, um, I don't know how much you know, but about these things, but there's a there's new artificial intelligence technology. Uh, there's a system called ChatGPT, which just draws on all of this supposedly scholarly information to answer just about any request for information that you can you can come up with. And so I've I've done a couple of videos where I take this thing for a spin and I just sort of start questioning it like Socrates would. And I show how how careless and inaccurate the responses are, how it contradicts itself, and all. And this is the problem with modern science: it's just very sloppy, very careless. Um, and most of the stuff that's said in the name of modern science is is only half true or not even true. Not because there's anything wrong with science itself, but just because the the use and the study of science is so careless and sloppy. Plato. Uh, the philosopher had a school in ancient Greece, and uh, just so you know, he his his rule in the school was that no one was allowed to enter into his philosophy school unless they had first studied geometry. So this geometry course would have been 
the requirement for anybody to even get into Plato's school. And you're going to see why very quickly, because this geometry course teaches you how to think. It teaches you how to be exact. It teaches you how to reason. And the standards are so perfect with regard to the reasoning that once you learn to think like this, once you get used to how it feels to think like this, you're never going to be able to think any other way because you get a taste for this kind of accuracy and clarity and you realize how nice it is to think this clearly. And once you get that experience, you can never go back to the careless sloppiness that's common in modern schools. So what we're going to do in geometry here to get to the point, we're going to investigate magnitude at rest. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what can we know about magnitude at rest? So magnitudes are bodies, right? Physical bodies that are not in motion. That's a magnitude at rest. We want to know as much as we can know about magnitudes at rest, about bodies at rest, any physical thing that is not in motion. We want how much can we know about it? What can we know about it? That's the goal of geometry. And when we start geometry, it's as if we're saying, we really don't know what can be known or how much can be known about bodies at rest. But we're going to go on a little, a, a little journey. We're going to go on this investigation and we're just going to move one step at a time and we're, we're going to see where this investigation leads us. What can we know about magnitudes at rest without assuming anything without leaping to any conclusions that we haven't proven first and so on. What can we know with absolute certainty about magnitudes that are at rest? That's the goal of geometry. So what we have first, let me share my screen here. So to get started, and don't bother trying to read this, I'll, I'll zoom in in a minute. <clears throat> so in order for us to start this investigation, we can't assume anything. We can't assume to already know things and then go study and pretend that we're studying things when we're already assuming some things to be true. This is one of the problems with modern science. Modern scientists and especially modern science teachers who are the worst, the modern scientists themselves, they might be okay, but the school teachers who teach science classes, they're the worst because they will assume things that have never been proven and just talk about them as if everyone already knows them to be true, where that's the whole question in the first place is whether or not these things are true and what can we, what can be known about the natural world. In classical geometry, we don't start like that. In classical geometry, the first thing we do is it's, it's as, if, uh, as if some philosopher sat down around a table and before they started studying uh, this subject and getting into this question, what can we know about magnitudes at rest? They sat down with a piece of paper and they said, well, let's think about what we already know. Let's think about what we know and what we can use to figure out what we don't know. But first, let's figure out what we know. And there are three kinds of things that we can say that we know. And we're going to see them here in this lesson. You can see right here, the first the first type of thing we can know, definitions. And the reason we can know definitions is because we're allowed to make up definitions. That's that's for us to do. So if, if we're going to have a conversation, before we have our conversation, we can take a minute and say, look, let's let before we get started here, let's let's define some terms. Let's make sure that these certain words we're going to use always have the same definition. So all of our conversation is clear. We can define terms to get a conversation started, and we'll all agree that these definitions of these terms are good and true, okay? So the first thing is definitions. The second kind of thing we know are called postulates. Down here, postulates. Postulates are things that we can do, things that we can do that are really simple, okay? Things that we can do, and we'll talk about these in a minute. So postulates, things we can do. Definitions, what words mean. Postulates, things that we can do in this investigation. Actions we can take that are very, very simple. And then thirdly, axioms. The third list of things would be axioms. 
Axioms are statements. You'll see that each of them is just a sentence. Axioms are sentences that we know to be true. And the reason why we know them to be true is because they're self-evident. Self-evident. That means that these are statements that we can know to be true without any need to try to prove them. Their, their truth is just obvious. They have to be true. They're just simple. Um, and the, the key word is self-evident or obvious. Simple, self-evident truths. And we'd like to know how many of these truths there are because we can start reasoning from these truths because we know them to be true. So we can take these as starting points to begin reasoning. And the method for investigation in geometry is going to be reasoning. We're going to use reason to work from things that we know to things that we don't know, because that's what reasoning is. In reasoning, we start with something that we know, and we use it to draw a conclusion about something that we didn't know when we started the investigation. So for example, let's say, you know, I've got, I've got Blaze here, and I wanted to know if Blaze, um, I want to know if Blaze is, uh, is, is rational. Okay, so I said, so the question is, is Blaze rational? And we don't know. So we don't know Blaze. We don't know anything about him. He's this, this, uh, this guy we meet one day. We say, is Blaze rational? And uh, we want to investigate whether Blaze is rational. So we're going to use reason. If we're good philosophers, we're going to first start and ask, well, what do we know that could help us to answer this question? Is Blaze rational? And we can sit there together and we could say, what do we know that we can we could use to get started with this investigation? And I could say, wait, I know, I, know, I have something, I know something. I know that man is a rational animal. Man is a rational animal. We all know that to be true because it's true by definition. Man is a rational animal. So if we want to know if, if Blaze is rational, um, we could ask whether Blaze is a man. Is Blaze a man? Because if Blaze is a man, then Blaze is rational. So I could say, yes, Blaze is a man. So now I've got two statements of things that I know. I could say, man is a rational animal. That's one thing I know. And then I could say, and Blaze is a man. That's the second thing I know. And from those two things that I know, if you put them together, you can draw or you, you, you'll notice your mind will automatically draw a conclusion that if man is a rational animal and Blaze is a man, then Blaze is a rational animal. So we can draw the conclusion and answer the question based on what we know already using the, uh, the faculty of reason. So that's how the investigation works. How do we find information that we don't know? We, we find information we don't know by thinking about things that we already do know, and we use reason to draw conclusions from those things. So that's the method we're going to use in geometry here. <clears throat> so the, the points we're going to start from, we're going to start with definitions, postulates, and axioms, and they're the only tools that we're allowed to use. We're not allowed to use anything else. We're not going to use tape measures. We're not going to use rulers. We're not going to use scales or anything else. There's nothing else we're allowed to use, just these three kinds of information and human reason. That's it. That's all we're allowed to use. And we're going to take these things that we know, start reasoning with them, and we're going to draw as many conclusions as we can as we investigate this subject. And if you look at the geometry course, you'll see that there's 13 books in the geometry course 13 books, all of that information in those 13 books is drawn by reason from this information right here on this page. So this information right here, which is a very little bit of information, produces, thir uh, well, produces, like I said, 13 books filled with information about magnitudes at rest. That's how powerful reasoning is. So if I flip to the next page, just from book one, remember there are 13 books in geometry, just from book one, reasoning with those definitions, postulates, and axioms, 
we come to conclusions on 48 different topics. So you can see here, there's 48 propositions. This is just the first book of geometry. Using that information, using the definitions, postulates, and axioms, we'll be able to discover 48 things, 48 truths about magnitudes at rest just by reasoning from those definitions, postulates, and axioms. And this is just the first book. It goes on for 12 more books, okay? So that's where the, the art or science of geometry comes from. It's just reasoning from these basic things. Now, these basic things, the definitions, the postulates, and the axioms, because they're the starting points for the whole science of geometry, they're called the elements. And that's why the famous book that we study, where we learn geometry from, is called The Elements of Euclid. So Euclid was a famous ancient philosopher. He was a mathematician. He was the one who, who organized and conducted this investigation and discovered for us the art of geometry. His name is Euclid. I'll write it in the chat just in case you've never seen it. E-U-C-L-I-D, Euclid. So he wrote, he published a book in the ancient world titled The Elements. And the reason why it's called The Elements is because we're starting from these elements, these definitions, postulates, and axioms. These are the elements. And we're reasoning from them and using them to investigate the topic of magnitude at rest. So that's why the book is called The Elements because we're using these elements, these starting points to then investigate this subject, okay? So what we've got to do here in this, in this study, the first, the first uh, challenge that you have is you've got to memorize these things. You've got to take maybe a couple of weeks, maybe you've already done it, I don't know. Um, you've got to take a couple of weeks and you've just got to study and memorize these things. You've got to memorize these definitions You've got to memorize the postulates and memorize the axioms. It takes a little while, but you can do it. It's not too hard. Um, the reason why you have to memorize them is because when we get into the proofs and things like that, anytime we ask a question, the answer to the question is in the elements. So you're only allowed to use the elements. So anytime that there's a question, you've got to be able to mentally scan through all of the elements and think, is there anything that I know that helps me to answer this question? That's how reasoning works. And so we memorize the elements and then we use them to answer questions. Now, in this course, Euclid has already done all of the work for us. So we're not really, we're not really investigating the subject because it's already done. Euclid's already done it. He's written for us all of the all of the answers and the proofs and everything. We're simply studying everything that he discovered and proved for us. But in order to understand it, you're going to have to understand these elements. And if you just move on to the, to the next lesson without learning these things, you're not going to understand what's going on. So you can't just try to get started with geometry without first studying the elements. Otherwise, you're just going to have no clue what we're even talking about. So the first step in classical geometry to get started is you've got to memorize and master the definitions that Euclid gives us. You've got to know the postulates and you've got to know the axioms and you've got to know them really well because the whole study is based on these things. This is why even though geometry is a challenging subject, kids who are seven years old can get started in geometry because it's just memory work to get started. So the beginning is this memory work uh, any any kid of any age can get started in geometry. Um, and for you, if you're getting started later, you still have to start in the same place because we've got to understand uh, these definitions and postulates and axioms. So what I'd like to do today, we've got some time. I'd like to just walk through them. Um, whether you're here in the live class with me or you're going to be watching later in a recorded uh, video, I don't know where you're at or what you've done yet. So uh, rather than assume where anybody's at or assume anyone's already done this, I'm just going to walk through uh, the elements for the rest of this video. So we've got 
23 definitions, by, uh, four postulates, and five axioms that need to be learned. So let's just walk through them together just to make sure all the language is clear. And I'll make a couple of notes just to, to avoid any confusion so you can study them uh, without any trouble. And if you can't really see this, it's, it's okay if you can't really see this, because if I zoom in, I'm going to have to scroll all over the place. So just try to follow along if you can. Um, I'm going to put a link. I'll put a link to this document where I've got all of the elements summarized uh, on the course page, which you can download and keep in your binder or on your desk or on a bulletin board or whatever. So the first definition, and you see these definitions are named definition 1.1, definition 1.2 and so on. What that means is um, the first number is the book number and the second number is the actual definition number. So definition 1.1 means the first definition of book one. Definition 1.2 means the second definition of book one, all right? And we'll just refer to them like this in this course. We'll so you're going to need to refer to these definitions and there needs to be a way to refer to them that we all understand and agree on. So that's how we're going to uh, refer to definitions. So definition 1.1, definition 1.12, and so on. The same is true for the postulates and axioms. The first number identifies the book. The second number identifies the actual number of the definition or postulate or axiom. So starting at the top, and, and this is going to get complicated, so, so buckle up and follow me here. It looks simple, but it's not so simple. The first definition says a point is that which has no part. A point is that which has no part. Now, if I went to the board here and I, and I wanted to show you a point, what I would do is I would draw a dot. And the problem when we draw a dot is that a dot is not a point. A dot is exactly the opposite of what the definition of a point just told us. A point is that which has no part. A dot, if I draw a dot, or if there's any kind of physical body, it has parts. A point has no part. That is, a point has no size. So a point is not actually visible. There's no, there's no visible point. A point is an idea in your mind. It's not something you can see. If I draw a dot on the board and say, okay, here's, here's point A. I'm just using that dot as an illustration of an idea, but the point, the dot is not actually a point. So that's what's confusing when we get started in geometry. A point is just really a place where something is. It has no size itself. It's invisible. It has no part because it's actually not a body. So just make sure that's clear. We use dots in geometry as symbols of points but it's only because we have to do something. And the simplest thing is to make a dot, but a dot, it, it can be divided into parts. So a dot is not actually a point. It's just a symbol we use to represent a point. So we've got to understand this first concept. A, a point is that which has no part. It's an invisible place where something is. That's what a point is, all right? It's invisible. A point is that which has no part. That's the first definition, the uh, definition of a point. Secondly, a line. A line is a breathless length. A line is a breathless length. So a line has length, but it has no breadth, no width. So a line is also invisible because if I took a pen or a pencil and I drew a line, it would have length. But because of the width of the line that I draw, it would also have breadth, and therefore it wouldn't be a real line. It's just a symbol of a line, okay? In geometry, when we use the word line, we're talking about something that has length and no breadth. Therefore, it's invisible, okay? So you've got to, you've got to understand the difference between the real idea in geometry that we're talking about and things we draw just as illustrations, just as symbols, okay? A line is not something that you can see. So don't think of something visible. A line has length. So it has, it has length. It can be measured in length, but it doesn't have breadth. So it's invisible, okay? 
Now, the reason why we start at a point is because a point is one thing, and it's the simplest of all things. Definition 1.2, we have a line, and the reason why we can move from a point to a line is because what we're doing, what we're really doing is we're adding a second point. So if we have point one, we have definition one. A point is that which has no part, okay? One point. If we were to stick another point or think of another point, we would now have two points, but we would be able to connect those two points and form a line. And if we look down to, if we look down to the postulates, look at the first postulate. The first postulate says we're allowed to draw a straight line from any point to any point. So if any time that there are two points in geometry, we have a line. You got that? Anytime we have two points in geometry, we have a line because we're able to connect points. And that connecting figure, which goes from one point to another, that's what a line is. A line is a length that has no breadth. Anytime we have two points, we automatically have a line because we can connect those two points, right? So we're starting with the simplest possible object, which is a point. Then we're simply adding point number two, and then we're using postulate one to connect the two points and we form a line. We've come to definition two. A line is a breathless length. So what I want you to see as we go through the definitions, we start with what's most simple, and then we just begin to add points and see what happens, okay? What happens if I add a third point? What happens if I add a fourth point? And so on. So it gets more complicated as we go. But we start with a simple idea of what a point is. And then every time we add a new point, we can draw a line. Now we've got two, two points and a line. And that's how you've got to think about this as we move forward. Okay, so a line is a breathless length. And then definition three, like I just explained, the extremities or the ends of a line are points. So at the end of a line, we have two points, okay? And I want you to see how all we're doing in these definitions, we started with the simplest possible thing, a point, and then we moved to two points. Once we moved to two points, we all of a sudden had a line connecting the two points. And that's how we're going to build and develop this knowledge. So we started with knowing something about a point, which is the simplest object in geometry, the simplest object at rest. And then we moved to the next simplest, which is a line, which is a connection of two points. The second kind of magnitude at rest, a line. Definition four, we learn a little bit more about a line, a straight line. So we learn about a certain kind of line, a straight line. Here's the definition of a straight line. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. So a straight line is a line that moves from one point to the other and never, never wavers in any direction from that path between those two points. That's the definition of a straight line. Pretty easy to understand, a straight line. So definitions two, three, and four have to do with lines. Definition one is a definition of a point. Definition two, three, and four are definitions that relate to lines. Now in definition five, we get a little more complicated. Definition five, we've learned about a point. We've learned about a line. In definition five, we learned about a surface. A surface, <clears throat> another name that you'll see for surface, I'll just type it here because it will sound kind of weird. Another name for a surface that you may see in our lessons is superficies. And it's a real word. It's a, it's a, it's a weird word we don't really use in English, but superficies is just another name for a surface. So both of those words mean the same thing. Definition five, a surface is that which has length and breadth only. A surface is that which has length and breadth only. Sorry. A surface is that which has length, like a line, but it also has breadth. So it's long and wide. So as a symbol, again, this is a symbol. 
as a symbol of a surface, we could think of a sheet of paper, a flat sheet of paper. Um, that's what a surface is. It has length, it has breadth, but it has no depth. And if it has no depth, we can, we can only see it in one direction. We can see it in length and width. But if we were to turn it sideways and look at it from the side, it would be invisible. All right. So it has length and breadth. That's what a surface is. And now what I want you to think about, think about a surface in terms that we've already studied so far. Um, and I'll just ask you a question. Think about this. If a surface has length and breadth, how many points must there be in a surface? How many points must there be? Just think about that. How many points must there be to form a surface? What would be the least number of points that could exist? Four, that's a good guess, okay? Four would give us like a rectangle, right? And, and you're, you're probably thinking that because I said sheet of paper, but remember a triangle can also be a surface, right? It's got length and it's got breadth, but no depth. So it could, it's, it's, I would say three, okay? We're moving from one point in definition one to two points. And when we have two points, we form a line. And then if we add a third point, we now have three lines. So if you think about three points on a sheet of paper, you can connect point A to point B, you can connect point B to point C, and then you can connect point A to point C. So three points would produce three lines by the first postulate, okay? So as soon as we had three points, we would have a different kind of figure. We would have a figure that's, that's more than a line because it has length, which the length of one side, but it also has breadth, even though it has no depth. So a surface is really what we're doing is we're connecting lines together, connecting more than two points. And when we connect more than two points, we form a surface. Surface is that which has length and breadth, but no depth, okay? Definition six, the extremities of a surface are lines. Notice how definition six relates to definition three. The extremities of a line are points. Definition six, the extremities of a surface are lines, all right? So we've got this idea of a surface. Now we're going to learn a few more things about surfaces here. Definition seven, a plane surface, a plane surface. So this is a certain kind of surface. A plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines of itself. A plane is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. And notice how definition seven relates to definition four. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. Definition seven, a plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. A plane surface, to put it in simpler terms, is a flat surface, okay, a flat surface. Now, where these lines connect in a surface, something else is produced, a new figure is produced. And what I want you to see is, as we get into this geometry, we move from the simplest form, a point, to more and more complex figures. So we move from a point to a line, then we move from a line to a surface. And when we look at a surface or when we think about a surface, we notice that there are a number of new, new objects for us to think about. First, we have the surface itself. But if we look at the points where the lines connect, we find that these lines come together and they form a new concept, which is an angle, right? An angle, a relationship of a space between lines where they connect. So in definition eight, we learn what an angle is. A plane angle or a straight angle or a flat angle, a plane angle is the inclination to one another of two lines in a plane, which meet one another and do not lie in a straight line. So anytime we have two lines coming together at a point, you know they have some measure between them, 
some inclination between them, that inclination or that, that distance between them as they connect to that point, that's called an angle. And if they, if they lie straight on a, on a surface with each other, it's called a plane angle. Okay, so we've got this new concept, an angle where these two lines connect. Definition nine, when lines containing the angle are straight, so if the lines are straight lines and they come together to form an angle, then the angle is called rectilineal, an angle made of straight lines. Okay, that's definition nine, a rectilineal angle. All right, definition 10, when a straight line set up on a straight line makes the adjacent angles equal to one another, each of the, I'm sorry, each of the angles is right and the line is, and the straight line standing on the other is called perpendicular. So let's, let's talk about what this means. It's very simple. A right angle. What is a right angle? In geometry, when we hear the word right, it means straight. So the words right and straight, they mean the same thing. Okay. A right angle is a straight angle. And what it means is if we have a straight line, if we have a straight line and on top of that straight line, we set another straight line. So, and, and they, they connect and they form two angles on each side of the line so that the two angles are equal. Then those two angles are called right angles or straight angles, okay? Right angles. So right angles are two equal angles that are divided by a line, a straight line joining together with another line. And those two lines are said to be perpendicular. So here's an important vocabulary word, perpendicular. Perpendicular means that two lines join together in a way that forms two right angles, okay? Like the letter T. Perpendicular means that two lines come together. Lines are said to be perpendicular when they come together so that two equal angles are formed on each side of the line where they meet. And those, those angles are called right angles, okay? Now, in modern, in modern geometry class or in modern science, we would say that a right angle is 90 degrees. But if you look, we haven't said anything about any degrees anywhere yet, right? There's no, there's no talk about degrees or anything like that. So get all that stuff out of your head. That has nothing to do with classical geometry. We're not measuring degrees. We're not taking out protractors and measuring angles. That's modern geometry. That has nothing to do with classical geometry. We're not measuring anything in classical geometry. We're simply reason, reasoning about these different figures. So the definition of a right angle in classical geometry is simply a line that's produced, an angle, sorry, an angle that's produced when a straight line is set up on another straight line and it makes two angles that are equal to each other. Those angles are right angles. That's how we define a right angle in classical geometry. And we say that those two lines are perpendicular to each other, okay? So no talk about 90 degrees or anything like that. Definition 10 tells us the definition of a right angle. Next, <clears throat> definition 11. If those lines come together so that they're not, they, they don't form two equal angles, but let's say they come together with a different inclination, we then have the angle on one side of the line is going to be less than a right angle, and the angle on the other side of the line is going to be greater than a right angle, right? So perpendicular lines form two right angles. But if that line changes its inclination, we now have a, one angle that's less than a right angle and one angle that's greater than a right angle, okay? So if we just move the line, change the inclination of the line, something else develops, a different kind of angle or two different kinds of angle. In definition, we learn that an obtuse angle, obtuse is an angle greater than a right angle. And acute is an angle less than a right angle. So a straight, uh, two lines that connect that are perpendicular that form two equal angles, those two angles are said to be right angles. If the angle is greater than a right angle, it's said to be an obtuse angle. 
If the angle is less than a right angle, it's said to be an acute angle. And just so you know, in Latin, the word acutus means sharp, like an arrow. Acutus means sharp. If you think if somebody gets an, a sharp pain, like you get a, a cramp or a pain in your side, you say, I've got an acute pain in my left side. That's how a doctor would describe it, an acute, a sharp pain. So the word acute just means sharp. It's very easy to remember that. Acute arp, acute angle. An obtuse angle means uh, um, the opposite of acute. It means, uh, what we would we say, like a dull angle. That would be obtuse, okay? Um, if if you meet someone and they're not very smart, um, they're not very they're not smart. You know they they they're slow to answer questions and they get lots of stuff wrong. Uh, one one name for a, a person who's not very smart is obtuse. We say you know you're you're pretty obtuse. That means you're like a you're dull. You're you're a little dull in your thinking. Whereas when someone is smart, we say man that guy is sharp, right? Sharp and obtuse acute and obtuse in angles, okay? So, so we've learned three kinds of angles. We've learned right angle, obtuse angle, and acute angle. So that's how we want to refer to these things as we study geometry. Definition 13, a boundary, a boundary is that which is the extremity of anything. A boundary is that which is an extremity of anything. So in the chat, tell me, what is the boundary of a line? What is the boundary of a line? The boundary is that which is an extremity of anything. Very good, Blaze. The boundary of a line is a point. What's the boundary of a surface? A line. Very good. Okay, so the boundary of anything is the extremity of it. The end of it is the boundary. The, the boundary of a line is a point. The boundary of a surface is a line. Definition 14, a figure, a figure is that which is contained by any boundary or boundaries. A figure. So what is a figure? We might call this a shape, right? So when you think about geometry being a study of shapes, which is how most people think about it, even though that's not exactly right. A figure or a shape is that which is contained by boundaries. Anything that's contained, anything in, in geometrical ideas, any magnitude that is contained by boundaries is called a figure or a shape. Now, here's a challenging question for you. I just said that when, when people think about geometry, they often think about shapes. So they think about circles and triangles and squares and cubes and pyramids and all this kind of stuff. Why is that not really true? Think about what we've studied so far. When people think geometry is the study of shapes, think about what we've studied so far. Who can tell me why that's not really true? What people think about when they talk about geometry is not really what we're studying here. Why not? Who can tell me? It's a little more complicated than that. Why are we not really studying shapes? Because we're studying what makes up the shapes? Uh, well, we're definitely doing that. That's true. Uh, James says shapes are only symbols of what we're studying. Very good. That's right. Okay. Remember, everything that we've described so far has it, the, the lines we've talked about, they're invisible. The surfaces that we've talked about, they're only visible in one direction. They're invisible from the other direction. So we're not necessarily talking about things that we, we can see. And that's, that's what makes geometry a little more complex. Really, these are concepts that we're contemplating in our minds. We're not talking about something that's sitting on the table that we're looking at. These are things that we're contemplating. And we're contemplating them based on their definitions because they may be invisible. And so we're simply contemplating. And this is what contemplation is. Contemplation is to study something mentally because there are many things that we have to understand. We have to understand them and it's impossible to study them in any kind of physical body. And that's what contemplation is. Contemplation is the study of what are relatively invisible things. And we're able to, do, we're able to contemplate 
because of reason, because God has actually made us capable of contemplation. So the reason why you can think about what a point is, even though it's invisible, is because you have the power to contemplate. The reason why you can think about a line that's invisible is because you have the power to contemplate. You have the power, even though all of your knowledge comes from the senses in the beginning, you have the ability to separate your thoughts from physical things and think about things that are invisible, that can't be sensed. And that, that thinking is called contemplation. So you may have heard of saints who are contemplative, well, it makes sense that saints would be contemplative because what do they spend their time thinking about? What do, what do saints spend their time thinking about? Give me an answer in the, in the chat. People like Teresa of Avila and Thomas Aquinas, they think about God, right? And God is an invisible spirit. He has no body. So in order to even, in order to think about God, you've got to be able to contemplate. You've got to be able to think about things without the help of your senses. That's what contemplation is. Um, so usually if we talk about God, we draw a picture of God, right? And someone will draw a picture as a symbol of God. Um, they usually draw God as being big. They draw him as an old man, things like that. We draw pictures of God. But we have to realize that anytime we draw a picture, we're not really saying that that's what God looks like. We're simply using it as a sign or a symbol. Because in order to think about God, in order to study God, you've got to use contemplation because he's an invisible spirit. So that's what it means to be contemplative. And in geometry, what I want you to see is the same kind of thinking that you need for religion, the same kind of thinking that you need to think about angels or God or eternity and things like that, that same kind of thinking is the thinking that you need in geometry. And that's why Plato said he doesn't want any students who haven't studied geometry. And one of the reasons why is because in geometry, we learn contemplation. We learn how to contemplate. We learn in practice how to think about things that are invisible. That's what contemplation is, okay? So moving on here. <clears throat> a figure, we could say a shape, but the word we're going to use is a figure. A figure is that which is contained by any boundary or boundaries. That's a simple definition of a figure. And then we're going to learn about a bunch of different kinds of figures. <clears throat> definition 15, we learn the definition of a circle. Now you may think that you know what a circle is. <clears throat> you may think you know what a circle is, but you have to have this exact definition of a circle in order to study geometry. You can't have a sloppy definition, like if I, were, if I were to say, what is a circle, and you just sort of came up with some sloppy description, like a circle is a shape that's round, um, and that's, that's not going to help us, right? We've got to have an exact definition of a circle. So here's the exact definition of a circle. A circle is a plane figure, okay? It's a plane figure. We learned the definition of plane figure. Um, uh, definition seven, we learned what a plane surface is. A circle is a plane figure. It's contained by only one line. It's contained by only one line. So when we look at definition 14 and we see a figure is contained by a boundary, by one boundary, you may wonder how in the world could a figure be contained by just one boundary? Well, a circle is an example of a figure that's contained by just one boundary. But that boundary is not a straight line, okay? That's why we define straight line above because there are different kinds of lines. Not all lines are straight lines. The line that forms the boundary of a circle or the extremity of a circle is not a straight line. A figure is that which is, I'm sorry, a circle is a plain figure contained by one line such that all straight lines falling upon it from one point among those lying within the figure are equal to each other. What, what in the world does that mean? If we were to take this line, which is the circle, and we were to make a, a thousand different points anywhere we wanted on that line, on that line of the circle, if we were to make points around that line, 
and we were to draw a lot we would be if we were to draw a line from that point on the line of the circle we'll we'll learn what the name of that line is in a minute if we were to draw lines from that point on the circle down into the circle we would find that it's possible to draw an equal line from every single point on the circle it's possible to form a a, a, a straight line from every point on the circle that's equal to the line drawn from any other point on the circle. In point in uh, definition 16, we learn that the point which we could connect to, which would make every line equal, is called the center of the circle, okay? So there's one point inside of a circle. And if we draw a straight line from that point to the line that, that forms the boundary of the circle, we could draw a line and that line would be equal in length to every single point on the circle from that center point. That's what makes a figure a circle. Every point on the line is equal in distance from the center. That's what makes a circle, okay? That's our, that's our official geometry definition of a circle. That definition, definition 15, uh, I want you to sort of, uh, when, you, when you do study it, I want you to, to put, put a star next to it because when we get into our first lessons in geometry, it, the propositions, that definition is going to be very important. And I want to think about this a little bit. Um, we're probably going to stop here. And I just want to give you one more thing to think about. When we started, we said, if we start with the simplest simplest figure, we have a point, right? Simplest form, I should say, we have a point. If we have two points, we can draw a line and connect those two. We can draw a line connecting those two points. If we look down at the postulates, postulate number three tells us that we can do something else that's pretty interesting. Postulate three says we can describe or draw a circle with any center and any distance. So if we have two points, any time that we have two points, we can draw a line based on postulate number one. We can draw a straight line that connects two points. So if we have two points, we automatically have a line. But if we have two points, we also automatically have a circle. Okay, And this is sort of like a mental breakthrough that you have to have. If you have two points, you have a circle. And the reason why is because you can take one point as the center and one point as the distance to the boundary of the circle. So you have two points. One can be the center. The other one can be the point on the boundary. And then using that measure, you can then describe around the center point a line that's equal to that distance and it will form a circle. So a circle can be formed from two points. So if you've got two points, you can form a line using postulate number one. And if you've got two points, you can form a circle using postulate three. So two points produces a circle. Three points, if we were to add another point, we would then have a triangle. But two points are required for a circle. So a line has two points. A circle also consists of or is constructed from two points. Okay, so I want you to connect those things. Connect <clears throat> definition of a point with uh, a line, which is a connection of two points, then with that postulate, which says that we're also able to use the two endpoints of a line as the center and the distance of a circle and describe a circle around that point. That's why if you ever look at a geometry, usually it's symbolized with a compass. If you know what a compass is, it's a tool. It's got usually a metal tip and a pencil on it. And the reason why that's necessary for geometry is because you can stick the point of the compass on one point and the pencil tip on the other point and then spin the compass around that metal point and draw a line that's equally distant from the center. And that produces, um, that produces a circle based on postulate number three. So if we've got any time we've got two points in geometry, we've got a circle. We just have to describe that circle according to postulate number three, okay? So definition 15, we have the definition of a circle, which is really a figure drawn um, about two points. 
and we learn about the center point of the circle and we're going to cut off there so we'll cut off with definition 16 here what i'd like you to do if, if you haven't started studying geometry i'd like you to start working on memorizing these definitions next week we'll go through the rest of the list make sure everything's clean but that's all for today okay i'll let you guys get going if you have any questions i'll hang around but otherwise you're free to go all right take care